I'm Matt Landau from VRMB, and this is Unlocked, Season 9, Home Runners. This episode features Simon Lehman of AJL Consulting, and I will say up front, this interview is the culmination of how ideas change, how people change, and how some things about our unique sector will never change, despite ungodly amounts of money being thrown at them. I invited Simon up to a hotel suite last week in Las Vegas to talk about a little beef that we had that started off our relationship back when I was on vacation in Guatemala. And I remember the moment vividly speaking with Simon for the first time while watching a volcano erupt in the distance. But Simon and I have come a long way in our respective thought leadership. We've learned the industry from very different vantage points over the years, and we've done so with our own unique style, only to arrive at some of the very same conclusions, truths, I'd even call them, together, which I think gives extra credence to their meaning and their application. This episode is brought to you by Point Central, the leaders in smart home automation and breezeway a property care and operations platform. And unlike every other episode this season, I forgot to ask Simon what home runners meant. Instead, I asked him to share with me the story that made us friends, well, frenemies in the beginning. So here I was um, invited. It was one of the first VRMA Europe conferences. It was in Amsterdam. And I was, was I transitioning or was I already working for Focusrite? I think I was transitioning. Can't remember exactly the year, should know. And I was having a speech about distribution, third party versus direct distribution. And I said to the audience, you know, spare your money and don't send it to San Francisco, to Google, right? That was my line. Like, Direct marketing is a total waste of money. Right. Uh, and your friend Tina sent that to you in Guatemala, and then you started a shitstorm online without even knowing me. And I was like, who is this bastard? Who is this arrogant <coughs> guy called Matt Landau? And then he was putting this post out saying, like, I have no clue about marketing that I, I just... Uh, no, did I, I don't think I ever would have said that. It was pretty bad, I remember. We, we will find it online, Matt, right? <laughs> the archives. That's right. Simon's got them saved somewhere. So I was like, oh, my God, who is this guy? So I asked around and said, yeah, there's this freaky guy down there. And and then I contacted you and said, listen, mate, we better have a conversation together because... I don't remember this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I saw all these posts online. It's like, how dare he... You know? No, there was not more than one post. No, but, but now some you're replies. Exaggerating. No, no, not from you. No, 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 not from you. But they, they, but the, for the replies, right? Oh, the post. Oh, yeah, and then people getting in, engaged. Right? I don't remember this. So I said, you know, don't send the money to Google. Spend the money on local branding, right? Put branded towels into your properties. You know, brand the stay. Oh, I definitely don't remember this. So people remember who they stayed with because. You know, when, when I became CEO at Interhome first, it was in 2005, we did a market survey with Focusrite in 2006 because I knew Focusrite very well, Douglas, and they wanted to do something in Europe. And so we sponsored a vacation rental study in Europe. And and one of, one of the largest part of the outcome of the result was, or one, one of the observations was that 70% of people who do a, a vacation rental, they don't know who they stayed with. Right, they don't remember the name. And that was for me mind boggling. So I went to my marketing manager and said, why on earth do we spend these millions when 70% of the people don't even remember they stayed with Interim? It's a waste of money. And I think it's still that today. So I, had, I was on the panel with Alex, uh, Annie Sloan yesterday from the host co. And I said that, they said, guys, you know, people don't remember where, where they stayed. They might remember the channel, which I will not name, but they will not remember the guy who actually cleaned the toilet. And that for me is something I'm so passionate about and we need to change that. 
So <clears throat> that struck, struck up a beautiful friendship between us. And we've been watching each other grow yeah, absolutely. over the last few years, get to see each other in different parts of the world, most recently in Porto. That's right. At Antonio's conference. We're both ardent Antonio supporters. Absolutely. What do you think made this particular event special in Porto? I think it's it, it was a combination of many things. I mean, people were ready. It was a new location for literally many, many people. I've never been to Porto. Porto is a beautiful city. I love Portugal. The, the culture of the Portuguese people is very hospitable. They're very nice people. So I think it was a combination of many things. I think it was the combination of, you know, Antonio putting that in Porto. It was, just, it was what I loved about the fact is that it was a separate venue from where people stayed mm -hmm. and it was not attached to a hotel. So everybody stayed in a rental, which I like literally everybody. Some took hotels. So I thought I found that absolutely incredible. So he actually forced people. Antonio has always done that, right? So he's always had freestanding venues like the Opera in Como, which was obviously mind boggling always to go there. I mean, who has ever had the chance to speak on an opera stage? That's pretty unique. Me and you. Me and you. <laughs> That's right. So I think Porto was a great combination of many things. And look, there's a lot of followers of, of uh, Antonio and Christina, his wife. Christina doesn't get enough attention, you know, and she should get a lot more attention, especially this year round. And um, but they're a, they're an incredible couple. They're so passionate about this industry, and and what's good about VRWS, it's 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 about the industry. It's not about them, right? So and that that I find absolutely amazing. You know, he's built strong friendships over the years, and he's got a massive followership. And I think he needs to be. I told him we had a debrief call just last week, actually, and one of my only feedback that I gave to him: be careful. That's the only thing I said to him, and he says yes, I know, Simon. And and the, and the fact of that is that he needs to be careful that he's not losing that vibe. And if he grows about 500 attendants, it can be very dangerous. So I think he's very mindful of that. That's a microcosm of our industry in a way, right? That's true. It's a microcosm of the industry, but while you still can exchange a lot and ideas and, and the collaboration at the VRWS, I find absolutely mind boggling. Um, these round tables are very powerful. They're not good for my business because we're consulting. They do that, they do that on the table. Just kidding. But uh, this year he went a little bit too far. Like this uh, speed dating, that didn't really work out the way he wanted it to. For some it worked apparently what I heard and for some it was not really good at all. I think that there's an experimentation about um, everyone in our space in trying new things and innovating. Some of the things work, some of the things don't work. You learn, you evolve. Where did you begin your life? Oh, wow. I began, I began my life on the 16th of December, 1970, in a hospital in Zurich, Switzerland. And, um, and I was a traveler from the day I basically was born. So, um, you know, after turning, like finishing my apprenticeship at 20, I moved to Australia when I was 20 years old. So I couldn't move further away from my parents than Australia. So it was pretty far. What kind of apprenticeship? So I did an apprenticeship in freight forwarding, logistics and supply chain management. That sounds hilarious. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, you know, actually not because I wanted to become a chef, right? So I was, I was, I wanted to become a chef. My mother always wanted me to go to university and study and be, and then I said that my, my father always said, no, the Simon is not made for the school bench. He's made to work, right? But he said to me, Simon, look, you can keep cook chef as a hobby, but don't do it for a living. You're not going to, you're going to regret it. Right. So I had to accept it. I did. I felt, I felt, yeah, I was actually smart, but then I felt what, what is giving, getting me out in the world. Right. But were you cooking at the time? No, not really. I mean, a little bit. I, I went, I was in the Boy Scouts. Right. So until I was 18, that's where I learned my leadership skills. So um, at the age of 18, I managed Boy Scout camps with hundred kids and uh, like entirely responsible for the entire camp for two weeks. And one of my best friends always helped me to cook there. And, and he's still one of my closest friends. He does now catering for us when we do things. He's actually my oldest friends. We got christened together in the Scouts when I was six. So it's now 50, 46 years ago. So yeah, that's when it started of me liking to work with food. And, um, but freight forwarding was, was a great alternative. My 
parents said, you know, we know somebody in town who's done a freight forwarding apprenticeship uh, for three years. You should speak to them. And I was hooked on the day I... <laughs> if, if my parents told me that, I'd be like, that sounds terrible. Do, were you excited about that kind of work? Yeah, I mean, you know what you do, like in, in Switzerland, you have to finish nine years of compulsory school and then you either go to college and university or you then start an apprenticeship. So 50 ah. 50 percent of people in Switzerland uh, do an apprenticeship. Oh, that's cool. And 50 percent of the people go to uni and, 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 and college. Right. So that's for like someone who doesn't jive with the traditional educational track. They will do an apprenticeship. Yeah. And apprenticeships, they're hard. You know, every job in Switzerland you need to have at least a three to four year apprenticeship. So when you finish, you are a total professional. So my son is now 18. He just finished a three year electronic retailer apprenticeship for an Apple uh, dealer in, in Switzerland. And he's super qualified, you know, and you get a salary during your apprenticeship. You do two days of school and three days of work. So you're a cheaper staff, if you wish, but you still have to go to school. So you, you do, you know, you have a lot to learn about the product, but you also have commercial education, you have language education. So I did, and then before you do that, you do like, you, you trial different jobs out. So you go for a day or two, if somebody wants to become a hairdresser, you go to a hairdresser for two days and think, is this me, is this not? That's so cool. We don't have that. Do we yeah, have no, anything it, like that in the States? Trade schools, but it's not really like that. That is cool. Yeah, it's um, it's it's unbelievable. It's, it's really cool and actually, uh, one of the youngest U.S. ambassadors that ever was in Switzerland, uh, Susie Levine, who's a great friend of mine. She used to be HR uh, head of uh, PR at Expedia. She was the youngest during Barack Obama's time. She was in Switzerland and she found this system and she really thought this is something I want to bring back to the United States. So, so you do that for three years and I wanted to do freight forwarding. So it's a commercial job. It's an office job, obviously, not forklift driving. I did that in my spare time, right? So, and I, I have a good story about it because I played piano with Elton John. So, so the, the fun thing is that you learn something, it's commercial. And what I liked about freight forwarding is international. Like we're shipping stuff all over the world. We, we, we opened the first McDonald's in Russia and we had, we had the contract from the manufacturer of the kitchen, which is a Swiss kitchen manufacturer. And we sent four semi-trailers of kitchen equipment to Moscow to build uh, the McDonald's and the Red Square. So this was your first professional world. Yeah. You... Freight forwarding, logistics and supply chain management. Okay. At what point did that pivot into the industry that we now know as vacation? Absolutely. Right? So then came Australia, then came uh, uh, luxury retail in Australia. Uh, duty free. I was logistics manager, the largest duty free retail in Australia. Then I went to Swissport, largest ground handling company in the world. We see them at every airport. And then 2005, I got a call from a headhunter um, saying, Hey, do you want to, do you want to go into the vacation rental industry? And I said, are you totally off your mind? In a vacation rental industry, I mean, th this industry that rents out these ugly apartments with sticky carpets and bad couches and that smell of smoke and stuff like that. This was in what country? Switzerland, okay. 2005. Okay. And, you know, at that time, vacation rental was like, this was like the secondhand car dealership, uh, Tupperware type industry where I, I, we used to do a lot of vacation rental as, a, as, as children. We had three, we were three boys, so vacation rental was good for us. My parents used that, but my experience was about the product was not always crash hot, right? And uh, we were still you know, like a lot of sales was done through the travel trade. So he said, have a look at the business. So I did. I came back and said, I love it. It's international. It's hospitality. There's a lot of things we can do in this industry. So it was an easy sell in the end? It was actually quite an easy sell. I need a bit of convin uh, convincing, but then I said like, this is super cool and and one thing that was important to me at the time age of 35 i wanted to become a ceo and i want to be responsible for an entire profit and loss statement and before i was a ceo as well but also in large larger um companies right so so fast forward to where we are today yeah where are we and what are we doing here for this special occasion we have covered a lot of ground since 2005 but there's still a lot of ground to be covered. And we don't need standards because we love the individual product, but we need execution operational standards. We still need to improve our game dramatically. I think there's still a lot of work to be done in vacation rental, um, but there's certain macro uh, 
macro elements that will not change. That's the hyper fragmentation of the industry. It's hyper local, etc. So I think we've come a super long way in terms of demand generation. I mean, we've seen HomeAway rising in 2005, which I happen to be part of that journey all the way. I was on the board of HomeAway until we sold that to Expedia in 2015. Uh, we saw Airbnb on the rise, you know, so the, maybe just one little story, which I th is a very important story to me. In 2006, I had a call from Brian Sharples uh, and Carl Shepard at Interhome saying, hey, can we buy you? And we already had them on the radar. They already started to make noise in the US. And I said, yeah, sure, come over to Zurich and we'll have a talk what you're after. So we met them at Zurich Airport. We were close there, at our office, and then we sat down with Carl and Brian. And uh, and I started to explain them the business and, uh, and it's a property management company, full service property management, end to end, okay. managing keys, exclusive, the whole the okay. whole yards. Founded in nineteen sixty five, one of the oldest companies out there, twenty four thousand unit at a time, and uh, I said we're actually cleaning toilets, and then and then Carl said, are you kidding me? No, we're not interested in that. We only do listings, right? We only a marketplace. So that was the start of a of an endless friendship with Brian and Carl. And I asked Car uh, Brian at the time, "What is your vision with HomeAway?" Right? And I still love to say HomeAway. I know it's called Verbal, but I can't say that. It sounds like a furball. Um, What's a furball? A furball, like the what the cats do oh, regurgitate. Yeah, furball. So anyway, <laughs> so I love HomeAway, and uh, I asked I asked Brian, "Hey, what's What's your vision with HomeAway? And he said to me, I want to make vacation rental the most respectable travel vertical in the world. I instantly gave him a hug and we, we're still friends today, right? So, so that resonated so strong for me at the, at the start of my career in the vacation rental industry because it was not respected. I mean, you, you didn't see any focus right uh, data on it. You saw no industry data, no market data, nothing at all, right? And not people didn't know this product. And where, where did your instinct go to begin introducing people to this product? I think, you know, the market, but the, the instinct, I mean, we saw it's clear, for, it's clearly good for the family. We had to do, we had to go digital, like a lot of our distribution was done through the travel trade with catalogs. So we had to digitize it. We had to make it visible. We had to make it accessible. Physical catalogs? Yeah. We were printing seven and a half million catalogs every year, like tons and tons of paper. And it's shipping them. Yeah. It's to the travel trade. And then they ended up on the toilet where people just flick through 300 pages of homes. Right. But what so, is it? A photo and like a description or something? Yeah. Three photos, a description and a, and, and a, and a price table, like which time like, of year. Yeah, time of year, which month, which season, and then you have to put your finger across and say, okay, for that week. And it's Saturday to Saturday, man. I mean, that the Saturday to Saturday is still huge in Europe, right? It's still massive. In, in the leisure destination in summer, you cannot book a house outside of Saturday, Saturday. Wow. Why do you think that hap evolved that way there as opposed to, let's say, North America? You know, I would I would say that the vacation rental industry is a lot older in, in Europe and, and more established. It's more mature. It's been around for a long time. As I said, you know, host seasons in the UK is over 100 years old. Uh, Interhome was founded in 1965, Interschelle in 1970. So it's been around a lot longer and, and that set different standards and also the way it was sold and the way it was distributed through through the travel trade and, and and things like that and i and and i think the tech enablement has then started to shift when you know revenue management how do i display prices all of a sudden people realize maybe i can make money renting a place for three days so <laughs> i think the us adopted that a lot faster than what the europeans did without a doubt one thing that is interesting though is that the us has when you look at the technology that property managers use in Europe, literally the, of the larger ones, up to like 200 units plus, nearly 50% of them still use proprietary technology. You think about that. What does that mean, proprietary? So they build their own PMS. Whereas in the US, nobody has built its own tech. You, you they, never imagined that. Yeah. That's right. So they use all the suppliers that are out there. In Europe, 
property management is so old where there was no software available. So there was no vendor on the market who could help you to automate your, your vacation rental business. So that's why they built their own tech. Is that changing in Europe? It's now starting to change, interesting, because a lot of these technologies, they are, are now super old. The engineers are, are out of a job or they're right. retired or maybe not even alive anymore. So now a lot of property managers are looking to swift from their proprietary tech to to uh, and, and obviously companies like Avantio, Gesti, they have changed the landscape so dramatically that it doesn't really make sense for you to build your own tech. You just right. use what's out there. Right? And it, it's also um, sort of given way to everyone at least here in North America, maybe if hospitality has always been in the vacation rental, you know, DNA of Europe, focusing on hospitality is the new thing almost now that the tech can do so much of the heavy lifting, right? Absolutely. And that's something that's universal, I think, everywhere. So coming back to your question, so, you know, in 2005, 5% of travelers use vacation rental in 2019, close to 40. Now it's 80. So, so we, we finally ad arrived at the mission that Carl Shep at uh, the ranch Sharples has. Respect. Right? We are a respected travel vertical. Everybody talks about it. You know, vacation rental is now at skiff that focus right everywhere. So, you know, we have made it right. Uh, obviously with hundred billion dollar companies like an Airbnb. And, and so it's, it, we, ha we have finally arrived. And now COVID was in a way a blessing to the vacation rental industry because that really just put the last accelerator on, on, onto it where people started to realize what are the benefits of vacation rental, right? It's just incredible, you know, privacy, you know, be on your own and, and can, you know, you don't need to stand at the buffet where everybody coughs over it in the hotel, which is not a good experience. So now the, the biggest challenge that we have is that we need to retain these customers, you know, 68% of travelers, they also consider hotels when they make a choice of, of hospitality. And now they, they choose vacation rental. And now we're having guest experience software popping up like mushrooms because now everybody talks about guest experience, guest experience, guest experience here as well. So it's super cool that it's it's not a tech piece anymore. It's not about the distribution anymore. Demand is here. The OTAs bring plenty of demand. Yes, direct booking is important as well, which I'm a huge advocate as well. But at the end, demand is not a problem. Supply is a challenge. You know, how fast can you grow and get supply? The challenge is can you execute an absolute outstanding guest experience so the people will return? And that's where I think hopefully we're not going to fail because that customer has different expectations. You know, now we need to be smart in what, what else can we offer in the property, upsell services, whatever it might be. These hotel guests, they have another expectation than somebody who's done rentals for the last 20 years. You're not going to get excited get him excited. Maybe if, if you had a handmade soap in the bath, maybe that gets exciting. But the, the new guest, we need to really do a good job. And now a word from our sponsors. Point Central provides smart property solutions for smart vacation property managers. They help streamline operations, protect the property, and enhance the guest experience using keyless access. Why? Because guests are tired after traveling, duh. And being able to go directly to that property with keyless access instead of stopping at a manager's office, this is no longer a luxury. This is a standard practice. Plus, everybody loves avoiding extra trips due to lost keys, not to mention the constant cost of rekeying. Point Central partners stay aware with an activity log of who enters and leaves the property, which helps keep track of cleaning and maintenance crews as well. You can also gain control of your utility bills with their smart thermostats. Schedule set points so guests won't be able to drastically raise or lower the temperatures, for instance. You can ensure the temperature stays consistent when the unit is vacant. Prevent costly maintenance projects caused by water leaks, mold, or HVAC issues with real-time alerts that allow you to be proactive. Visit pointcentral.com VRMB to learn more and Breezeway, whose property care and operations platform helps you coordinate, communicate, and verify the detailed work and deliver the best service experience to your guests. With tools for intelligent task scheduling, quality assurance, real-time work coordination, guest messaging, supplies management, owner reporting, and more, oh my, 
Breezeway helps thousands of short-term rental managers and hospitality operators increase your operational efficiency and eliminate hours of manual work. This allows you to boost your service revenue. It was created by the founding team of Flipkey, which was since acquired by TripAdvisor, and Breezeway is just elevating the experience at every property they touch. Visit breezeway.io slash VRMB and get implementation fees waived. That's a $1,000 value right there. Okay, let's get back to the show. There's a lot of um, money flowing into the industry too. And do you um, see that at ever, ever coming at, to odds with this attention to detail, the small scale, the hospitality that maybe doesn't scale the way that traditional private equity or venture capital wants? Great question. I shouldn't say that. And you always ask a question. And the, the point is, that's definitely something we're going to be challenged by. Because what, one thing that I'm absolutely, like I, I've been, I've changed my mind as well. And I've, I've changed what I used to say in the past at conferences oh. in terms of, I was really thinking that consolidation is actually doable. Consolidation is not doable in our industry. I always say now, I call vacation rental ads a mushroom industry. You, you chop one off and five new ones are growing up. And we have seen a lot of attempt and a lot of capital. I mean, let's remember Vacaso had a SPAC at 4.2 billion and they lost nearly 60, 75, 70% of their market cap on building something consolidation, buying things together gets get larger. You know, operationally, you could make it happen. You need unit densities, et cetera, et cetera. But one thing that will not go away in our industry is the fundamentals of the supply that is privately owned and the only asset that vacation rental has is trust and relationships. Now, how do you scale relationships? You can manage 100 owners personally. 200 is going to get difficult. So, so scaling trust of homeowners with your company is extremely difficult. And, and I think that's why, you know, people, it, it's very difficult to build a scalable operational business that makes, uh, makes good money. What was the moment that changed your your thinking on that? You know, to be honest, Matt, I've been thinking about consolidation from the day I started into this industry. I mean, I start, I was the CEO of one of the largest already when I started. And I was like, how can I get this to 50,000? And it's an interesting story. In 2005, I went to visit the CEO of the largest, of our largest competitor. And he asked me a question. I just simply started in this industry. He was already in it for like for 50 years. And he said, Simon, why do you think we can't scale above 25,000 units? And I was, I had this question in my head for 18 years. The penny dropped on the day, and this is not a joke, when Vacasa bought Turnkey. That Vacasa hit the ceiling at 24, 25,000 units. They couldn't grow further. If you look at Novosol, if you look at Interchalet, if you look at Oyo, they're all similar sizes. They platform, they hit the Without ceiling. Without an artificial injection. That's right. Okay. To make an acquisition, to grow above that. And why is that? Because, you know, scaling locally and, and operating and everything is very hard and it's very cost intensive. So to, to repeat that back, you saw that the exponential growth or organic growth had limits. Absolutely. And you know, another factor is that I would like to throw into that. I think one thing that has fundamentally changed and nobody has able has been able to achieve of the large boys, nobody has been able to create a consumer facing brand in vacation rental. There is not one. I mean, you go down Fifth Avenue in New York and ask people if they know Vacasa or V trips, doesn't matter who, nobody would have a clue who these companies are. If you ask them, do you know Marriott? <laughs> so hotels have been very good at that and, and, and always have been. It was never in the true strategy. I mean, you know, Interhome, Interchalet, Nova Sol, the big brands in Europe, they have 60, still 60, 50, 60% 60 direct business, right? But these are a lot of repeat guests who've used rentals over time, right? So I think that's where the breakthrough is going to happen. And, and therefore, I think franchise has a huge chance but a lot of franchise models don't focus on the brand either. So I think the, the, the 
direct the the direct brand for the consumer is what is the key um, to actually grow bigger because you have the demand under control. And I would add, it's the key to grow on whatever you want to grow. It, you could have one property, and if you're doing that well, you have more freedom and independence, and you can command a top dollar, right? Absolutely. Or 100,000. Absolutely. So how do you help people who are either new to the industry or who are thinking about resetting their businesses identify what they want? So property management companies come to us with all different type of challenges. Like what is the ideal company structure? Can you help me on building my technology stack? What, which PMS should I use? Which channel manager? What how, home automation should I use? Revenue management. Uh, how do I run operation? How do I scale? How do I build a larger company? It's so interesting. We have a lot of companies who, who come to us and say we want to grow. And they say they want to grow into a new, new, new destination. And my first question is, what's your addressable market in your own destination? I say, why do you want to grow outside? You still have 5,000 homes to get. And so what are you actually ultimately getting to? How do you help them identify what they want out of their business? That's all. That's my first question. What do they say? I, we, we get the, so many different answers. Some have, I don't know, I haven't thought about it yet. Others say I want to sell in three years. Others say I want to grow to 500 units. Others say I want to get out of it. There's, there's tons of different answers, you know, and then we ask them about their brand, about their positioning. Who are you? You know, what, what do you want to be? Who is your competition? A lot of companies don't even know who their competition is. Like, what is your positioning? We do SWOT analysis, there's strengths and weaknesses about the business. And, and, and we try to give them answers. We try to give them a path. To, to sort themselves out. And they after like after three days when we work with them, they're like, oh, this is fantastic. Now finally we have a perspective. We know what to do, where to go, what what is next. And that's wonderful. And we're helping companies to solve their challenges. Shifting into future predictions. Mm -hmm. um, most of our listeners on this podcast are vacation rental operators. They're not vendors. They're not um necessarily into tech at all. They're operating properties on a ground level. Mm -hmm. Where do you see uh, the biggest opportunity for this demographic over the course of the next year or two? The biggest opportunities? I think it's, it's, it's funny on coming back what we discussed before. I think it's, it's, it's lifting professionalism and, 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 and guest, meeting guest expectations. I think there's massive opportunities there. You know, in, in from an upselling standpoint to for people to potentially rebook, like create high repeat rates. Repeat rates are very low in this industry. That's, well, compared to what? Well, to probably consumer facing brands like hotels, they have massive repeat rates because they have loyalty programs They, you know, I mean, Marriott has over 80 percent direct traffic. I mean, they don't need to go to the OTAs. Right. So. I think there's opportunity there, like more on, on the brand, on the local side of the brand, you know, have the brand visible in, in, in the units and, and deliver a good guest experience and know your customers. You know, I think that's a huge opportunity. A lot of companies don't even know the customers. A lot of operators don't have a CRM. You know, while the demand is still coming, well, why should I, why should I bother? Well, this can change. And I think COVID has shown very brutally that if the demand stops that uh, you have a problem, right? And and I've a lot of people experience that one the hard way. And I think a new generation of folks are entering and a lot of people are just at their absolute peaks right now. A lot of our colleagues are just um, reaping the benefits of all that hard work. What about the downfalls, the threats that they're not necessarily watching out for? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think I think you need to stay up to speed on what is happening out there in relation to technology. What is best practice as well in terms of operations, not just technology, but best practice on operations. You know, it's 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 about it's about the, the chocolate on the pillow. Right. That's that's we're still missing that piece entirely. You know, I I had a rental just the other week. There was not even a shampoo. And I realized when I was already in the showers, that it was not a good not got a good situation right <laughs> so <laughs> you have to get dressed again and go and buy your shampoo right 
So I think there's a lot of downsides. I think we're, we're on the macroeconomical side, we're facing some pretty challenging times, but I'm not concerned too much because I've went through several crises in, in my career as a CEO in Interhome. We saw financial crisis 2008, we saw SARS, we saw 9-11, and the vacation rental always rebounded the fastest. It's super resilient business because it's slow assets, so it's assets light business. It's a great alternative to anything else in travel. So if you can't fly, okay, jump in the cargo to a rental. So I think we, we have proven that. And I think we have reduced our downfall risk massively because the categories now, people are aware of our category. <coughs> but yeah, financial impact, interest rates rising, you know, missing talents. I mean, human capital is a huge issue. Regulatory is, is you know, when I speak to investors and they come and talk to me about the vacation rental industry, I said regulatory issues are is one of the biggest risks to our industry. So we need to do far more together to, you know, this is not, hey, you know, John is looking after it. I don't worry about it. It will be fine. No, it's not going to be fine. So we need to stand together as an industry uh, with all the advocacy that's going on with VRMA, with Rent Responsibly. Everybody's out there. We need to really pitch in together because I think that's a risk and we can help that downfall. And I think that's one of the biggest downfalls that we see. Everything else is manageable. Even raising interest rates could be beneficial for us because a lot of people will have to start renting because they can't afford their mortgages anymore, right? So I think we've seen that in the financial crisis 2008, the vacation rental market was flooded with houses that banks had that they wanted to have some rent for. So I think the downside risk is absolutely limited. I would highly recommend to have as many distribution partners as possible. Don't just use one channel, use as many as you can, build a direct brand and de-risk. And then, then you have already done a lot of stuff, you know? To build the direct brand back to where we first began. That's right. Simon, back to where we first began, full circle. Full circle, you know, and you know, we need to be reasonable, but OTAs are great to also bring your leads, but you need to know your customers and so they come back, you know, so the direct distribution conversation is a very long one. But if you think, and that was my argument that you and I had many years back, is that if you think you, your, your marketing dollar that you're sending to Google is going to compete with a booking.com or an Expedia, then you know you might as well come to Vegas and spend it on the gaming table. <laughs> Agreed. Um, share uh, what we, we had a wonderful conversation in Porto. And I think one of the commonalities of all vacation rental professionals that I know is they run lifestyle businesses. Yeah. Doing what they love being with people they love moments is something that we try to engineer into our lives. Um, do you think people need to do more of that in our space? Because if you're just someone who works all day, every day, like a lot of us are just work animals, we don't take time off. What's the, what's I'm the so lesson? Glad, I'm so glad you're raising that point, Matt. And I'm, I'm actually one of the victims myself, right? because uh, you know I, I run a, a very competitive business and we have a lot of work and um, I, I, I love when things are going well. And you know, I've, it's, it, I made a couple in, uh, at the Avantio Partnership Conference in Valencia just a week after you and I met, and they're like, oh, it's our first time we're out of the business for three days in Valencia. It's like, what the hell are you doing? And now we're consulting them. They're a property management company with 40 units. And, and I say, I will help you to make your, you, that, that you have these moments. And it's not that hard because people think they're not replaceable. People think it doesn't work without me. People think, you know, we need to do this all day long. I need to do cleaning on Saturday and check in and everything else. And, and we don't really know how our financials are and said, okay, let's, let's see that. And I think within three days of conversations, they will have a very good holiday very soon uh, because it's doable, right? So you need to really try to step out and say, okay, well, I need to create these moments to to recalibrate, you know, we need these moments where we can just decompress and, and just let it happen because unplug, unplug, open, you know, just, just turn your mobile off. And, and, you know, I think I would probably, if I would go into the vacation rental myself, I would, um, I would do a vacation rental company for families that has no Wi-Fi block the Wi-Fi upon entrance entirely and have a have a have a phone blocker as well I mean spending time with friends and family we like we, we just 
we just don't even know how much we're missing out of, right? Didn't you and just go on a trip? That's right. Where so did you go? I went to Australia for five weeks with my fam. Uh, I used to live in Australia for seven years. I haven't been back for 16. And I wanted to show my wife and my kids how wonderful Australia is. And we went to North Queensland and I was, I, I was off the grid for two weeks. It was, it was probably the most amazing thing that I've done in my, in my life. Did you come back with any uh, um, epiphanies? Uh, yeah, many, but I need to execute, right? So I think it, it's, it's just you, you need to force yourself to do something that you always wanted to do. And then once it's, it's happening, you, you see it's actually doable. And then you just need to remind yourself that you need to build that into your habits, right? And we're, you know, we're people who are always falling back in our own habits and we need to break habits and, and creating moments, I think, helps us to break habits. And look at us here, buddies. Yeah, this is, this is pretty emotional for me, Matt. I have to say, you know, I followed you. I, you always intrigued me very much. You're like always saw a conference just, just running around like a, endless rabbit and doing things everywhere and uh, and uh, you know I was always intrigued and and I hear you know amazing things about you but you and I never really took the time together and, and spent and, and I really enjoyed our conversation in Porto even though it was in the evening and whatever but it was great to to sort of share our passion and, and I think we're so aligned in so many things and I think you're doing so many great and wonderful things for our industry and then you, you you need to have a lot of praise for that because we need people like you who are who are passionate and, and so are we and i think we can a lot of we can do a lot of things together extremely well for this industry What I think is most salient about this last statement is that taking the time to get to know somebody and appreciating them for their originality, even if you don't like their quirks or style or something that they say, even if you don't understand them, which is the case more often than not, this process is hospitality. And we can all be more hospitable, we can all be more patient we can all be more open. My big takeaway from the conversation is that consolidation is not possible in our industry due to the hyper-fragmented nature of our core offering. Of course, unless you're thinking about the new purpose-built inventory, but I digress. No matter what kind of vacation homes, the most precious asset of any vacation rental professional is trust which comes from relationship building slowly and steadily over time. That is a process that cannot be hacked. It cannot be bought. And also that people in your organization will mess up. Surely you will fail or embarrass yourself. But that is how we learn. I was recently speaking with Robin Cragen of Moving Mountains, who attributed a visit from Simon to his operation in Colorado there as a complete game changer. And I was speaking with Robin about a mistake that I recently made in my business. And he reminded me that if I was not having and recognizing those mistakes, I simply would not be growing and innovating. So here's my cue to you, dear listener, take that recent failure or mistake or wrong words that you said to someone or that someone said to you that for whatever reason is holding you back and shove them. Move on, grow, improve, and evolve and adapt your thinking. Coming back to Simon, I think it's cool that despite the very different paths that we each took, we now sing such very similar tunes. If this kind of message resonates with you, Consider joining us and over 1,000 of the world's most creative vacation rental professionals in VRMB communities. You can join at vrmb.com slash join. Until next time. If you need somebody, if you need somebody,
Stay.